state in the 1860s. The demand for railroad material was such that several different timber concerns became engaged in the production of axe-hewn cross ties from those forests across the southern edge of the state that were reasonably close to the railroad. In most instances, those cross ties and other timbers were hauled to the right-of-way by ox teams, but some stream driving was resorted to where conditions were favorable. A little later, such streams as the Laramie River, Rock Creek, Medicine Bow River in the eastern part of the state were driven, and Bear River in the western part was also used. Such now existing names as Woods Landing and Tie Siding reflect the early day logging activities. It is possible that the stream driving in general came about by reason of demands for additional cross ties for maintenance and also for ties to supply the standard gauge railroad that replaced the earlier narrow gauge ones. No outstanding timber companies continued in operation from the first efforts over any great period of time with the possible of exception of the W.H. Holiday Company of Tie Siding and Laramie. This company soon installed sawmills to supply not only the railroad with sawn products but to the fast-growing new towns and settlements. They concentrated their efforts around tie siding and, as the timber stumpage soon became exhausted, they moved to Laramie to establish an outstanding mercantile business. The man with his chopping axe and his broad axe was the backbone of the industry. In the earliest tie production, no cross-cut saws were used. The trees were felled with the chopping axe. The tree hand-hewed to size with the broad axe, and then the ties were cut to proper length with the chopping axe. The early day, tie hack was a good workman with his tools. In the 1920s, many of the old chopped off ties could be found in the woods, and the axe work indicated great skill, not only on the ties, but also on the tree stumps. There was a continuing demand for timber products for the railroad and the settlements after the first high spurts along the Union Pacific. As the Colorado and Southern and the Chicago and Northwestern Railroads came into being, logging of the timber extended into the Bighorns and elsewhere in the eastern part of the state. The Bighorn Timber Company perhaps developed into one of the largest in the northern part of the state. It operated on the Tongue River, but soon folded. No large, long-enduring, high-producing timber companies seemed to have been formed. Many started here and there, only soon to pass out of existence. Actually, the timber industry was unable to make itself felt in the general Wyoming economy until the vast forest resources was unlocked by the U.S. Forest Service in about 1898. Just about the turn of the century, large sales of timber were made by the government, and operations got underway in a legal manner near Green River, Kemmerer, Rollins, Laramie, Buffalo, Sheridan, Newcastle, and other places of less importance. High producers of forest products developed in most of these places, but the greatest volumes have been logged from these forests along the southern edge of the state. Production from the Green River and from the headwaters of the Wind River has been notable. This is accounted for largely by reason of the fact that water transportation was available. Stream driving became the order of the day. With the purchase of small existing timber companies such as Teller, Weber, Coe, and Carter, and others, several well-financed and aggressive concerns were formed. The most noteworthy were perhaps the Carbon Timber Company, the Wyoming Tie and Timber Company, the Standard Timber Company, which operated at Fox Park in Evanston, Wyoming. The Carbon Timber Company was organized about 1901 by Wagner, Meyer, and Andrew Olson with the purchase of the then-existing Teller outfit, which was operating on Brush Creek out of Saratoga. They may have acquired holdings from other small outfits. This carbon timber company expanded rapidly on the North Platte River drainage to include Encampment River, Douglas Creek, Big Creek, Pass Creek, Brush Creeks, and some other small streams. They also pushed their operations to include the Medicine Bow River and then to the western part of the state to include Black's Fork, Henry's Fork, and other streams tributary to the Union Pacific. By 1908, their production from the North Platte alone had reached 30 million feet, and a short time later, in one single spring drive from the North Platte, they moved and marketed about 52 million feet, representing by far the greatest single year out of timber in Wyoming by any one company. In 1916, the Carbon Timber Company ran into financial difficulties and were taken over by the Wyoming Timber Company, which confined its efforts principally to Douglas Creek and French Creek until they passed out of the picture. The Wyoming Timber Company was financially successful in their endeavors, but perhaps never reached a higher annual production in excess of 15 million feet. At contract time in 1939, the Union Pacific Railroad informed the Wyoming Timber Company that they would not accept any more river-driven ties after the 1940 annual tie drive. 
This forced the company to truck their ties to Laramie Tie Plant at a cost of 26 cents per tie, compared to an average of 7 cents a tie cost for river-driven ties. Consequently, the Wyoming Timber Company operated for a few years on a break-even basis and then liquidated its holdings and ceased operations. The Wyoming Tie and Timber Company, with many ups and downs, settled down to a successful business on the Wind River, but sold their entire Wyoming holdings in about 1946. Up until about 1930, following the rejuvenation of the Wyoming timber industry, the tie hack was the bull of the woods. These workers were made up of men who went to the mountains and into the forests with their chopping axes, broad axes, cross-cut saws, and their measuring sticks and peeling spuds, where they manufactured the cross ties by hand. Then they went into the fast water of the roaring spring floods and drove their ties to the railroad along with what mine props they had made. This 30-year period was during the days of horses, hand banking, and tremendous river drives when history was made with the broad axe in the woods, in the pike pole, and the streams. The tie hack, working as a single man, one man unit on the assigned strip of timber, expended with great physical effort of falling his trees, hewing the trees, peeling the bark from the rough sides of his product, cutting and clearing his individual strip road, and finally carrying out and piling his manufactured materials on the sides of the road. There was the horse hauling of the timber to the banking grounds on the stream banks, and in some instances to the railroads proper. Much of this hauling was performed during the height of the Wyoming winters on deep snows where sometimes the horses were fitted with homemade snowshoes to break the sled roads. At the time of the spring breakup, the hacks would flock to the reserved hand bank areas on steep ground nearby the streams where they not only made their cross ties but also hand hauled their products to the banking grounds. This hand banking employment continued in full swing until the drive would start and here the men would exert their most strenuous efforts urged by incentive pay so that they could go out of the woods with a greatly increased paycheck to blow in on sprees at nearby towns. The hand sled hauling was something to see. These hand sleds were something, sometimes real works of art being fully equipped with tie chains and rough locks. Some by choice or for lack of pocket money would continue on the river drive running the high hazards of the white water spending their long overtime hours wading hip deep and deeper in the cold water with ice and snow along the banks and sleeping and eating in fly camps that would, could be reached only by foot and pack trails. Special tie loading gangs manhandled the timber products into boxcars from scattered banking grounds directly on the railroad. These were fast moving crews where only the most sturdy could stand the pace of continual traveling or trotting for hours at a time carrying the heavy cross ties on their shoulder pads. The tie hack and his associates were heroic, hard-working, and hard-living individuals, but they had their masters and those men who directed and managed the activities in the woods. Rating perhaps first among these tie hacks, who started at the tree stump with their broad axe and who rose to positions of high responsibility through the various steps of advancement, were such men as Andrew Andy Olson, Sam Thompson, Osea Nelson, Brewer Eden, Martin Olson, and Hans Olson. These executives started as young men in the Wyoming forests and by native ability, strength of character, high principles, and strenuous personal drive helped to develop and in the end successfully direct timber operations of vast production. They were giants in their field and in their manner of directing and supervising men during their area of the tie hack days. It is interesting to note that all these outstanding men secured their initial training under the grand Norwegian Andy Olson of the Carbon Timber Company. It is also interesting that a still later generation of giant woodsmen have risen to command positions, and this later group received their training in turn from the preceding leaders. Such men as Ralph Crow, Lars Johnson, Ole Alexander, Carl Langendorf, Jim Johnson, and some others, not only profited by their training, but have risen to the point of either owning their production companies or are successfully directing timber concerns. This last generation of woodsmen have been able to fit their operations to the mechanical age and convert the hand manufacturer and horse logging to the present day system of machines. Interesting tales can be written concerning each of these men, but to date only Martin Olson of the Wind River has received much publicity. Andy and Hans Olson finished out their active careers in the forests as part owners of the Auto Lumber Company of Laramie, retiring about 1945. While they directed the Auto Lumber Company, they took out the last drives on the Laramie River and they reached production peaks of about 12 million a year. Sam Thompson had the distinction of having been on or having supervised every river drive from the North Platte and its tributaries. 
Sam demonstrated his abilities in the successful supervision of the Wyoming Timber Company, whose high production reached as high as 12 million or slightly more per year. He had also worked as a troubleshooter for the Fox Park Timber Company and to other timber concerns. Osea Nelson formed his own timber company in about 1918, getting his start in the production of mine props, but gradually expanded into ties and lumber in the Fox Park area and later into other sites. Osea probably reached an annual production of about 10 million a year at the height of his operation. Osea was the first timber operator to try out mechanical timber hauling when in 1924 he secured a hauling demonstration. This demonstration took place in the winter with a four-wheel drive truck hauling one or two sleds on a two-mile haul from the Weber place to the Fox Park Landing. He finally settled on a 10-ton Holt track laying tractor which hauled three and four loaded sleds in a caboose. The heated caboose carried a crew of fast-working loaders and unloaders who played high-stake poker when traveling between the beginning and the end of the road haul. Martin Olson took over the Wyoming Tie and Timber Company after it had run into difficulties in 1921 in production and management. He handled all woods operations, became part owner, and successfully managed the Wyoming investments of this concern for about 25 years. Production reached peaks of about 12 million a year. When river driving became too expensive and troublesome and on account of the many irrigation diversion dams, the company sold its Wyoming holdings and Martin retired. At the time of closing, Martin and his associates in the company erected an outstanding monument on the head of the Wind River at the foot of Togedy Pass. This carved stone monument and statue commemorate the tie hack and shows the hack in bold relief on the stone with his broad axe. Brewer Eden directed field operations for the Standard Timpener Company on the Green River out of Kemmerer. He was outstanding in the expansion and management of this concern until the time of his death in the late 30s. This company is now out of existence. Of the, so to speak, third generation of timber men from the Andy Olson School, Carl Langendorf and son operated Walden, Colorado. Ralph Crow owned and operated the R.R. Crow Company at Saratoga, which is now the Himes Lumber Company. Jim Johnson, Lars Johnson, and Ole Alexander, who operated for many years at about 5 million feet per year, have all passed out of the picture. The Osea Nelson Timber Company continued in operation for a considerable time, but passed out of the picture in the early 1950s. Several aggressive timber companies have come into being in late years, Brant and Wickland at Fox Park and Heinz Lumber Company at Walden and Saratoga. However, they do not make railroad ties. Lumber is their main product, with two-by-fours being the principal item. The late C.D. Williamson was one of the most successful of all the business managers of the early timber business. His association with Sam Thompson, who was timber manager, was a personal and financial success for over 30 years. This is a typical tie hacks cabin on the West Beaver Fox Park Timber Company sale. Ranger Williams is seated on the porch. The ideal lodgepole pine was about 11 inches in diameter at breast height. An eight foot length was standard, and in the 1870s, the Union Pacific required a measurement of seven by seven inches. A suitable lodgepole pine is being sawed by a tie hack using a one-man buck saw. After felling the tree, the tie hack clears it of limbs, preparing it for hewing. With an eight-foot pole, the tie hack measures off the length of a tie as specified by the Union Pacific. The tie hack then scores two surfaces with a double-bladed axe to proper thickness for hewing with a broad axe. After that, a tie hack hewing a tie is shown with his broad axe. The surface has already been scored with an axe to aid in the hewing process. This photo shows a tie hack peeling the bark from the tie with a spud peeler. Hewing has been completed and the hack will soon cut the tie to length. Finally, he will peel the bark from the underside. The bark is peeled off the underside with a spud peeler. By using a picaroon, the tie hack is able to skid the tie along the ground to the skid road where it will be piled for hauling. Log jams did occasionally occur. This drive of ties and saw logs jammed on Douglas Creek. Tie drivers sometimes had to resort to the use of dynamite to dislodge the material. 
Bull chain and boom at Fort Steele. The boom caught the river-driven ties, and the bull chain pulled them up and along the ramp past Union Pacific tie inspectors. The approved tie...